Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. I'm Brian McDaniel and I will be your guide on this journey through intoxication and withdrawal seen in substance abuse. This is the seventh video in my playlist covering all of the psychiatry for the USMLE Step 1 Medical Board exam. We're going to review symptoms and treatments for the use of various different drugs of abuse. This is low yield for the exam, but just to give you a foundation, we will start here. Substance dependence is an adaption to a pattern of substance use. It is primarily characterized by withdrawal, or symptoms that occur when the use of the drug is discontinued, tolerance, or needing more to obtain the same desired effect, and spending a significant portion of your time engaged in drug-related activities. Substance abuse is an overindulgence in an addictive substance as a result of a lack of control. It can be thought of as a more extreme version of substance dependence in which individuals has significant negative life effects with work, relationships, or school, poor health, or legal problems as a result of their substance use. In the general public, this pattern of substance abuse would more generally be referred to as an addiction. Now there is very specific DSM criteria for each of these terms, but that isn't important for the exam. For simplicity's sake, we will break the drugs down into three different categories. Three categories are uppers, downers, and hallucinogens. There are slight differences between drugs within individual categories, but for the most part, you can get the question right by just knowing the general characteristics of the entire group. For example, you won't see both cocaine and MDMA listed as answers on the same question. Also remember to not confuse intoxication and withdrawal. Most questions are on drug intoxication, but they may specifically ask you about withdrawal, which usually has symptoms that are just the opposite of intoxication. So make sure you read the question carefully. For example, the question stem may fit stimulant intoxication and depressant withdrawal, but the last sentence of the question specifically asks about withdrawal. Keep in mind, the most important thing for step one questions are the changes to the vitals and pupils. These should be the buzzwords you are looking for. You will almost always be given this information in these types of questions. And if you have just this info, you can usually narrow it down to at least two options. Also make sure you don't get mydriasis and meiosis confused. Mydriasis is the bigger word and has the bigger pupils. Meiosis is the smaller word and has the smaller pupils. And obviously the best way to confirm a diagnosis of drug use is a urine drug screen. And mental health services are important in the treatment of addiction. However, that is too easy, so you won't see either of those as an answer on the exam, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. That brings us to uppers or stimulants. Now, I'll try my hardest not to make 20 references to Breaking Bad during this section, but I can't make any promises. Most of the questions related to this category will be about cocaine, which is usually smoked in the form of crack cocaine or snorted. However, other street drugs such as methamphetamine, meth, and MDMA, ecstasy and molly, are also in this group. Prescription drugs used for ADHD, narcolepsy, and weight loss are also stimulants, but are less likely to show up in the step one question. This group of drugs functions through a number of different mechanisms, but primarily increases dopamine and or norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft by inhibiting the reuptake of these neurotransmitters. Patients under the influence of these drugs will have an acceleration of the nervous system. This is going to be similar to the sympathetic fight or flight reaction. You want your pupils dilated so you can see the rhino that's trying to chase you down, and you want your blood pressure and respirations higher so that you can react to the threat. Symptoms of stimulant use include increased vitals, tachycardia, hypertension, increased temperature and or respirations, pupillary dilation, irritability, anxiety, hyperactivity, diaphoresis or sweating, and elevated mood. Nasal septum ulceration or perforation and nasal mucosal atrophy 
is a result of nasoconstriction in the individuals who snort cocaine. This is another buzzword you should keep an eye out for since it commonly shows up on exams. Accelerated tooth decay and tooth loss is seen more commonly in users of meth and is sometimes referred to as meth mouth. Higher doses of these drugs result in overdose, which can lead to MI or angina, seizure, hyperthermia, stroke, arrhythmias, psychosis, rhabdomyolysis, or sudden death. Treatment for an acute intoxication often includes the combination of benzodiazepines, antihypertensives, and or antipsychotics. Withdrawal from uppers usually doesn't show up on exams, but it presents with a crash following drug cessation. It is generally not life-threatening and presents with fatigue, depression, irritability, and psychomotor retardation. Alcohol, opioids, or opiates, such as heroin, morphine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone, sedative hypnotics, benzos, and barbiturates, all fall into the category of downers or depressants. These drugs decrease neurotransmitters in the nervous system, and as you would expect, largely have a presentation that is the opposite of uppers. This class of drugs works through a number of different mechanisms, but mostly is due to activation of inhibitory GABA and inhibition of excitatory glutamate. I have already created a video about alcohol, which covers alcohol metabolisms and a number of other topics such as complications from chronic alcoholism. To be taken to that video, you can click on this orange box here, or you can look for the link in the video description. I will be discussing benzodiazepines in much more depth in the next video in the psychiatry section, which will cover all of psych farm. But I will also touch on the topic a little here. The use of downers can result in depressed vitals, pupillary constriction, meiosis, decreased pain perception, hence why opioids are pain medications, decreased gastrointestinal motility, abdominal pain and constipation, agitation, decreased anxiety, and somnolence or sedation. I don't think I have to describe to you what a drunk person looks like, but for completeness, I'll mention the use of downers and more classically, alcohol can present with disinhibition, slurred speech, falls, incoordination, blackouts, nausea, and vomiting. There are a couple laboratory tests that should also make you consider alcoholism. The two most important ones are elevation and gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, GGT, and elevated liver enzymes with an AST-ALT ratio greater than 2 to 1. Heroin users may have identifiable needle marks or track marks. At higher doses, an overdose can lead to loss of consciousness and respiratory depression, shallow or slow breaths. This is why the most important intervention for severe overdose of a downer is ventilatory support. For opioid overdose, you often use an opioid antagonist such as naloxone or Narcan. But you also have to be careful with the dose you give as you can easily cause withdrawal by giving too much. Flumazenil is a benzodiazepine receptor antagonist that is sometimes used to treat benzo overdose. Gastric lavage, aka getting your stomach pumped, and activated charcoal are rarely used in overdoses. Here's a slide from my earlier video on alcohol. I just want to quick remind you that when alcohol is consumed in large quantities, acetaldehyde, an intermediate of alcohol metabolism, builds up faster than it can be metabolized. Acetaldehyde is one of the things that contributes to hangover symptoms. A hangover classically presents with nausea, headache, fatigue, dizziness, gastrointestinal problems, changes in mood, and dehydration. You can use a hangover to your advantage when disulfiram is used to treat alcoholism and prevent relapse. This drug inhibits acetaldehyde dehydrogenase and makes patients very sick if they drink any alcohol, as acetaldehyde builds up much faster. You are essentially giving them a really bad hangover on purpose to dissuade them from drinking. 
However, this is not always effective as there is relatively low compliance for this drug. Patients considering drinking can think ahead and easily not take their medication to avoid the consequences. This is why disulfiram is not commonly used, but since it has basic science correlations, it still shows up on test questions. More commonly, counseling and mental health interventions like a 12-step program are going to be the treatment of choice for alcoholism and opioid addiction. Here's another slide from my earlier video on alcohol. It lists some of the more important complications of alcoholism that are high yield for the step one exam. I'm going to cover them in more depth in videos in the respective organ system. So for example, esophageal pathology will be covered in GI rather than here. Most of the withdrawal questions you get will be about downers. Withdrawal presents with symptoms that are opposite of intoxication. So you will have elevated vitals, dilated pupils, rhinorrhea, nasal discharge, diarrhea, excessive perspiration, restlessness, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, and nausea and vomiting. An odd presentation that should stick out as a buzzword to you is yawning. Opioid withdrawal is extremely uncomfortable, but is not usually life-threatening. Benzodiazepine withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal present very similarly and can be life-threatening. Prescription benzodiazepines, especially short-acting benzodiazepines, should be tapered to prevent withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal has all the withdrawal symptoms we have discussed, but can also have tremor, seizures, confusion, hallucinations, mostly visual, delirium, coma, and death. The severe form of alcohol withdrawal is referred to as delirium tremens or DTs. The first line treatment for DTs is benzodiazepines. You also have to monitor electrolytes like magnesium and vitamins like thiamine and folate. Antipsychotics and or temporary restraints may be necessary for severe agitation. Now we will move on to hallucinogens. PCP or phenylcyclidine, LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, and psychedelic mushrooms are in a category of drugs called hallucinogens. As you might guess by the name, the main features of this class is hallucinations and other psychotic features. This can be in the form of visual or tactile hallucinations and may be tough to differentiate from cocaine-induced psychosis and other psychiatric illnesses that are unrelated to substance abuse. I've already done an entire video on psychosis. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can click on this orange box if you're watching this video on a computer. Or if you're watching on a phone, you can go to find the link in the video description. Use of these drugs is not always accompanied by hallucinations, but you're unlikely to see a question on the exam that is missing this classic presentation. However, it may be useful to know that this diverse group of substances can also cause disorganized thoughts, paranoia, euphoria, anxiety, labile mood, belligerence, incoordination, hyperthermia, and synesthesia when letters or numbers are perceived as color. The effect on vitals and pupils varies with the dose and the specific agent being used. PCP is associated with violence and aggression more than any other drug. PCP intoxication also classically prevents with vertical or horizontal rotary nystagmus, or rhythmic eye motions. Benzodiazepines and antipsychotics may be used for treatment, but you can often just monitor the patient for dangerous behavior. These substances usually don't present with withdrawal symptoms. Marijuana can cause conjunctival injection, red eyes, increased appetite, aka the munchies, euphoria, perceptual changes, mild tachycardia, anxiety, and dry mouth. Marijuana may also be associated with schizophrenia and transient psychosis, which is why some may put it in the hallucinogen category. Users of marijuana usually do not present with overdose or withdrawal symptoms. No pharmacologic treatment is needed. That brings us to the end of this video. 
If you're using my videos as one of your primary study aids and would like to help support the project, please click on this green donate button here. Running the site takes a great deal of time, effort, and money, so anything you could spare would really help me out. The next video in the psychiatry section is going to cover psych medications such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers. If you would like to be taken directly to that video, you can click on this black box here. Unfortunately, if you're watching this video on a phone or tablet, neither of these buttons will work for you, but you should be able to find the donate button and psych farm video easily by going to the homepage of my website, stomponstep1.com, or by clicking the links in the video description. Thank you so much for watching, and good luck with the rest of your studying.